Dear guest speakers, colleagues, mayor, students, and participants online, it is with great excitement that I am able to formally open the John Hicks Centenary Conference at UWC Red Cross Nordic. We are, in many ways, an institution that mirrors the ongoing globalization of the modern world. Being a school that every year welcomes 200 students from often more than 80 nations. We are also, I would say, an ideal place to create spaces and activities for the promotion of intercultural understanding and interreligious dialogue. The need of being able to understand the intellectual, emotional, and traditional underpinnings of religion is arguably a necessity for becoming a true global citizen and might also be one of the main cornerstones of peace and true intercultural living. Celebrating the life and legacy of John Hick, one of the most influential philosophers of religion and theologians during the 20th century, presents us with a unique opportunity to ask ourselves important questions about the nature of religion and its cultural impacts around the world. In addition to making valuable contributions to many different discussions within philosophy of religion, John Hick might be, most might be the most famous defender of religious pluralism, and his philosophical hypotheses have been discussed and criticized for decades. Whether one agrees with Hick's ideas and arguments or not, it is clear that the different questions he engaged with are as important as they were when he started discussing them. I look forward to continue to explore this with all of you during this coming week. A conference cannot happen without the support of the right people and without knowledgeable guest speakers willing to share their wisdom and their passion for the subject. I would like you to join me in welcoming Eleanor, Mark and Peter Hick I will ask them to stand up and say hello. They are all children of John Hick, and they have been supportive of the event from the beginning, and they will soon address the college and present a prize donated by them in the memory of their father. We are most grateful for you attending this event. I would also like to officially welcome our esteemed guest speakers, and I will take them in order, and they will also stand up and wave a little bit. <laughs> so it's a keynote speaker, Professor David Cheatham. <laughs> Dr. Sharda Sugiritharaja. <laughs> Dr. Alan Race. Reverend Sonia Ratten. <laughs> Mr. Hugh Rice. <laughs> and Reverend Canon Philip Lambert. <laughs> I would also like to extend my welcome to two of our guest speakers who were unable to come in person but that will engage with you online during this week. It's Professor Perry schmidt Leukel <laughs> and Dr. Timothy Musgrove. <laughs> I say to all the guests that we are both humbled by your willingness to support this conference and privileged to welcome you to our campus and online, even in these trying times. Throughout this week, our guests will present papers and host workshops, all to interact with you students as much as possible. I am confident that you realize what a privilege this is, and that you take the chance to ask as many questions as you can. Without further ado, I declare the John Hicks Centenary Conference 2020 open, and I call on Professor Peter Hick to deliver his address. <laughs>
Thank you, Don. And hello, everyone. And uh, thank you to uh, the leadership team here at UWC and to the student organizers, to everyone who's made this uh, remarkable event possible. And it's, it's wonderful to be here all together in this beautiful country. Uh, I'm going to be very brief because I'm not here to speak about the philosophy of religion. I'm going to leave that to, to David and the other speakers. Uh, I'm here on behalf of my sister Ellie, my brother Mark. We did not know John Hick as a philosophy of religion. Of course, we knew him as our father. And as our, as our father, we are proud of him. And we're honored to, to represent him here today. And I think he would have loved an occasion like this. He, I think, always valued opportunities to engage in dialogue with young people, to listen and to, 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 to converse. And I think there can be no greater tribute, really, to the legacy of his ideas that, than the fact that you all would be willing to spe spend your time thinking about the issues that he was concerned with, to perhaps draw on some of his thinking to inform yours as you reflect on the world today and the future that you will uh, contribute yourselves to. And so, to particularly here at such an international college as Don has explained, I believe part of the nomination for the Nobel Peace Prize, at such a, a, a time of such heightened tension and international conflict, I think uh, it's interesting to reflect that for John Hick, uh, a principle that perhaps informed his life and the, develop of, the development of his thinking was a commitment to standing up for principles that he believed in. And he sta that started in his early uh, adulthood, uh, which, which was at a time of uh, international war, in which he took a particular stance that you may or may not agree with, but he, he took a choice to be what was known then as a conscientious objector. So he served in an ambulance unit in the Second World War organized by the Quaker Church. And that was not a popular choice to make in many circles, even in his own family at the time. And so standing up for beliefs, if necessary at some personal cost, I think uh, arguably informed his thinking. And so at two points during his career, early on and again later, he was actually charged with heresy by the church organization. And there were campaigns against his ideas. And indeed, one of the popes, uh, Cardinal Ratzinger, I'll, I'll call him, uh, was actually personally denounced him. So it's not the case that uh, his ideas were universally popular. I don't think I've really met anyone who really agreed with them all, actually. Uh, but it was about a dialogue with people who you may not agree with completely. And listening respectfully and trying to be accurate and understanding the views of someone you might not fully agree with to inform a real dialogue. And I think that uh, was also something that informed his, his approach. So um, I think this notion of religious pluralism that we can draw on today, it's important to understand that these ideas were developed not in abstract philosophical inquiry, um, disconnected with the real world. They were developed in response to engaging with the multi-faith communities in the city of Birmingham in England, which was a particularly uh, multi-ethnic uh, multi community in some respect. And he was actively engaged in campaigns against neo-Nazi organizations, far-right political parties, and I think um, engaging with local faith communities in those kinds of activities that informed the development of his thinking about religious pluralism, uh, as I understand it. So I think those are two important things that I would take from, from his work. So I just wanted to say that um, it was inspiring for us to read the winning essays in the essay competition, and uh, we're also reflecting on his ideas of religious pluralism. Uh, we're delighted to be able to donate a small prize to support this event, or to support the conference. And uh, congratulations to all of those who contributed, and especially to those who uh, were selected as the winners. So thank you very much, and have a fantastic week. We hope to speak to you again. So I'm going to allow um, Pete to stay on stage for a little bit because he's going to help me to 
to present the prizes to the prize winners of the essay competition. We had around 30 participants, and it was a really great turnout. And um, I'd like them to come up one by one so that they can, they can uh, get their diplomas. Um, it, this essay competition was in response to, response to a quote by John Hick, outlining briefly his religious pluralism, and asking the students to reflect upon this uh, with a background of the, their existence here in this multicultural and multi-religious environment. So the first prize winner that are going to receive their diploma is, and I'm sorry about pronunciation, Onofrio de Michele. So it was a shared first prize. I couldn't decide between them, and, and the, the second judge, Natasha, couldn't decide between them as well. So the second prize winner is Petrina van Neustadt. <laughs> So in just a second, we will hear our keynote lecture de de delivered by Professor David Cheatham. Uh, just a short point for people participating online. If you have any questions to the speaker, and since you are not present here in the room, can you please email them to me? The, that email address is on the same page as you found the link for the live stream. And then I will forward it to the speaker if time allows, and if not, I will forward them to David after the, the lecture. So now, please welcome your keynote speaker, Professor David Cheatham. Thank you very much. Let me just see if I, uh, this works. If I do that, oh, it works. That's good. That's it. So I'm, 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 I've got the same view as you have at the moment. I'm looking at this up here, because my, my laptop is somewhere up there. Hopefully, it's OK. <laughs> OK. Well, I, f I first became uh, interested in John Hick when I started to do my PhD. Because at the beginning of my PhD, I was going to do it on the topic of reincarnation. Uh, and my tutor probably took a look at me and thought, no, not, I don't think so, <laughs> maybe do some of the kind of topic. And my tutor was uh, a guy called Paul Badham, who is uh, a professor of theology at Lampeter University, and that's in the middle of Wales, if you want to look it up. But Paul Badham was also a student of John Hick. Uh, an expert on John Hick. So he said, well, why don't you choose to do John Hick, do a PhD on John Hick? Uh, and so I think that was probably the best advice I ever received because one of the things about John Hick's work is, that it, is, it, is it covers a whole spectrum of the philosophy of religion. You'll find, of course, that he touches on all the topics that have become the sort of talking points in the philosophy of religion, things like the existence of God, the problem of evil, religious language, and, of course, probably what he's most famous for potentially anywhere at least, is the topic of religious pluralism. How can all the religions, is the question, be true? And John Hick ap approached that particular question. So in this lecture, I'm going to give you some an overview, basically, I suppose, or an introduction with a few critical remarks to John Hick's thinking about the philosophy that he, that he conjures up and where all those ideas come from. But just to give you an indication, I, 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 let me just put this slide up. I wonder how many of you, in looking at the philosophy of religion, have come across these phrases. These are all phrases, more or less, that John Hick has put into the, into the literature. So if you quote things about where, the, where does experiencing as, or eschatological verification, soul-making theodicy, the epistemic distance, the replica theory, the Copernican revolution of a kind in theology, and the real, very, very famous concept. Well, these are all... Uh, the work of John Hick, they, 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 they are contained within his particular writings. And some people have wondered whether John Hick, Hick's writings are all of a piece, how to treat all the writings that he wrote. 
And I know that maybe Tim Musgrove, I think maybe he's giving a talk a bit about the different kinds of things that John Hicks said. But some people dispute the thing whether his ideas have changed over time. So you read some of the early books that he wrote, like Faith and Knowledge, and you see a particular kind of way of thinking. And then you read Evil and the God of Love, which came a bit later, and then Death and Eternal Life. And finally, his great magnum opus, maybe, in, in the opinion of some, was called An Interpretation of Religion. And some people say, well, he changed his mind throughout all that time. Uh, some people beg to differ with that. Some people say, actually, he re retained a kind of a commitment to some basic ideas in the philosophy of religion. So he was a big uh, fan of one particular philosopher called Immanuel Kant, for example. Um, and various ideas about uh, the future life or the soul-making ideas. Or the ideas of empiricism, I experience as being an important way in which we look at the world. are all ideas that you find throughout uh, John Hicks' uh, thinking. And some of the ideas that he thought out about in the, late, in the uh, in late 1950s or the early 1960s, you find them coming to, to fruition almost, arguably, right at the very end. So I've already kind of indicated something about a starting point for John Hick is experience. If you were to say, well, what kind of a philosopher is John Hick? He tends to take experience very, very seriously. So if you compare that with other kinds of philosophers like Descartes, for example, where rationalism was very much important about the, the cognition, as it were, was, was fundamental to how you do philosophy. For John Hick, it's more about what does the world look like? What actually happens in the world? And if we were to take the totality of what we see, what are the most kind of plausible hypotheses can we come up with? So as he says here in this particular quote, which I'm going to have to come around and have a look at, all experience in involving as it does the activity of recognizing is to be construed as experiencing as. Now that's an, an, an important starting point actually in the philosophy of religion because some people say, can we distinguish between religious experience and other kinds of experience. Is, is religious experience a kind of a, 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 kind of a, a, a crazy experience? Is it, is, it, is, it, is it a different experience? And I suppose one suggestion I'd make to you today is that if you read John Hick's philosophy, he would say that religious experience is normal because it's, a, it's about the totality of how we interpret the world. And to look at the world by, so if you look at objects, in a way, the way you interpret objects is the way you interpret, is also linked in a stage-by-stage in a, in a, in a, in a stage basis to the way you actually interpret the whole world. So all these experiences, thinks John Hick, are linked together. They, you don't have the, what you call the numinous experience necessarily that's, that's separate from all your other experiences. If you have a religious viewpoint, it's because you've looked at the world in a particular way and it's connected to all your other experiences is basically what John Hick is, is saying. And that makes him a very empirical philosopher. And so he's trying to kind of justify religious belief almost by saying, look, it's not a wacky thing that crazy people do. It doesn't, doesn't require a particular disposition. What it is, is it's a particular way of interpreting all of your experiences and viewing them as having a certain kind of significance. So if, if you, if, if what, what John Hick does is he takes you through the stages, if I got it there. So, oh, I'm, uh, sorry, I forgot that, I forgot that slide was there. So what do you see when you look at that picture? Do you see a duck or a rabbit? And I don't have to answer that question because it's meant to be that you could see both. But maybe if you could, some of you can see where the duck, the, the beak is on this side and the rabbit's head is on the other side. And this is an idea that you find within, say, or an idea that was influential on the great philosopher Ludwig Wittgenstein because he said that we have a particular way of looking at the world. We see it as a certain kind of thing. And that experiment, as it were, the, the duck-rabbit experiment, Jastro, is, uh, is a, a kind of a, an illustration of seeing as, seeing things in, in particular kinds of ways. Now, if you were to say, oh, which is the correct way of looking at that picture? Is it a duck or is it a rabbit? That's the wrong question to ask, isn't it? Because you can see it in Either, uh, any different kind of ways. It's legitimate to say it is both a duck and a rabbit. That's crucial, by the way, into how we might look at religious pluralism. Uh, maybe you can begin to guess how these uh, ideas start to connect together. But that's an early idea of seeing as. Now, John Hick comes along and says, well, seeing as is a bit of a limiting concept. It's a bit of about how we visualize things, how, how we look at particular things. Experiencing as is a much more total, kind of holistic kind of view. We experience the world in, in its broad sense in a particular kind of way. 
So what John Hick is doing, he's building upon seeing as, and he comes up with this phrase, experiencing the world as. And we can interpret the world in different kinds of ways. Now, there are different levels of experience. So you might think, well, surely there are some experiences that are direct. There are some experiences that we can't necessarily uh, interpret. Maybe there are certain kinds of experiences that are so immediate that you would never go through a process of interpretation. So some of you might say, well, I'm looking at my hand. Well, clearly that's an immediate experience. I don't have to interpret that. Well, Hick would beg to, beg, beg, beg to differ there. He would say, well, actually all experiencing comes through some kind of a filter. So, for example, if you look at a fork, which you use to eat, well, we might look at that object and think, yeah, it's a fork. He wouldn't even ask any questions. But, of course, there are lots of people who would look at a fork and think, what's that object? So things that, even th that we think are fundamental might be open to interpretation, even at that limited level. Now, you might, and, and also, of course, it's practical, isn't it, to take the world at face value. There are some things that are more immediate at the, at the natural levels. A bus coming towards you, you're not going to say, oh, do you interpret that to be a bus? No, you get out of the way. Um, the point is that, John says, is this laws, this is the physical, laws we must learn and towards which we have continually to relate ourselves are right if we are to survive. But nonetheless, even at this level, even at the where, we, where we're most certain of our experiences, i.e. the physical level, John just says, well, there's still an act of interpretation going on. One of the analogies he gives, for example, is you might see a rabbit in the distance on a field. And somebody might say, no, it's not a rabbit, it's a tuft of grass. Uh, it's capable of being interpreted or being misinterpreted, even at the physical level. And then there's the moral level. So that's the first level, the, 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 the physical level. Where, where it's the most immediate kind of experience, but even at that level, there's a form of interpreting going on, says John Hick. Then there's moral experience. Now, you might see that moral experience is, is more open to interpretation. You, have, you, know, you, you look at events, and you have a, a greater degree of freedom, says John Hick, to interpret what your actions ought to be. But what John Hick seems to think is, is that even at that level, there's a degree of, of, of certainty almost. Now, let me give you an, an, an analogy. So, say you see somebody uh, 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 kind of heading towards a cliff. Now, would you feel responsible <laughs> about that? Would you feel you had to go off and say, hang on a minute, don't go over the cliff? And if, you, and if instead of doing that, you said, oh, let's go to lunch. Uh, you just walked away from the situation and just let whatever's going to happen, happen. Now, you might say that you've missed something factual, factual about that situation. That somehow there was something about the event itself that was asking you to do a particular kind of thing. And it was so self-evident that you should do that, that it was almost a fact. But of course, it's not quite as factual as buses and forks and physical objects. But it's almost to say that at the, even at that level, as you build upon the, the, the physical, the moral interpretations you have can somehow be so compelling that you feel as if they're almost facts. So as he writes, the world of moral significance is, so to speak, superimposed upon the world, so that relating ourselves to the moral world is not distinct from the business of relating ourselves to the natural world, but is rather a particular manner of so doing. So you can see that there's kind of a layering going on in how we read the world. The natural is more certain, but still interpreted. The moral is, in, in a way, superimposed upon the natural, but involves a bit more freedom of how we interpret, but there's still a bit of factual nature to it, too, to, 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 thinks John Hick. So let's go up the level again. Now, what about religion? What kind of where does that fit in? Is it a natural experience or is it a moral experience? What layer does, do we place that particular kind of interpreting at? Unless this is, this is the, kind of the, the kind of the higher level. And Higgs says, re perceiving religious significance or none is a voluntary act of interpretation. Because one of the things he thinks is that actually the world is capable, it was ambiguous enough of being interpreted in different kinds of ways. So there's the natural experience, I, is that a fork or is that a bus? There's the moral experience, what should I do? But then there's the other kinds of things, and that's what's it all about? 
Where does this all go? How do we add it all up? How do we interpret certain events that take place? Let me give you an analogy. So imagine if, uh, I remember a couple of years ago, I, I went on holiday and I went to a particular beach in Spain. And lo and behold, on the same beach were my neighbors, the people who live next door to me. They'd chosen ex exactly the same day or exactly the same week to go to that same holiday destination and they were on the same beach at exactly the same time. Now, how do you interpret an event like that, that kind of coincidence? Do you say, wow? Now, some people might say this. They might say, wow, that's so coincidental. What, what, what are the odds of that happening? It, there must be something of greater significance about that kind of event. I didn't feel that way at all. I thought, oh, my goodness, I've been trying to get rid of these people for one. Uh, I get away from these people. So, so I, thought, I, I, di I didn't see the coincidence. That for me, it wasn't significant in that way. I just thought, oh, how am I going to get out of this? Uh, let's go to a different restaurant. Let's, let's run to the other side of the beach. Um, what would you do if you bumped into your neighbors? Now, now, some people think, oh, it's a God appointment because it's so coincidental, there must be some divine intervention. Maybe we're meant to be here. Maybe we have to, maybe to have a conversation. For me, I just thought, let's get the hell out of here, you know, <laughs> and go somewhere else. But see, so, so the point is, there was an event which you might say is significant and coincidental and interesting, but it's capable of being interpreted in different ways. You can read it as a negative experience or, or as a, a non-significant experience, depending on what you want to see. And some people might see a coincidence then as being extremely instrumental or important about how to interpret the world. But at that particular level, which is not natural or moral, but interpretative at, at a significant level, you, John Hick would say you have a greatest amount of freedom about how you look at the world. The world is built as a kind of a uniquely ambiguous environment, therefore, that seems to allow you to validate both atheistic or significant or non-significant events and read it in a particular way. So, so you can see that the basic model epistemologically, and epistemology is the theory of knowledge, is that... John Hick is committed to a, an experiential outgrowing, as it were, of things until we get to that final interpretative element of significance of what it's all about and how does it all add up. Now, you can see that that's a particular viewpoint in the philosophy of religion. There are others who would disagree. They would say, well, God breaks into the situation and, 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 and provides some kind of e external revelation that in a way shatters all those kinds of experiential confirmations. Uh, but John Hick is, is an empiricist sort of thinker. And so he's growing, as it were, all these kind of in, in experiences up together as how we interpret the world. So he writes, significance, by significance, I mean that fundamental and all-pervasive characteristic of our conscious experience, which de facto constitutes for us the experience of a world and not of, of a mere empty void or churning chaos. So that's the biggest thing of all. We all have, all, and so you can see what, he, what you might mean when you say, well, religious experience is not anything, nothing unusual. Because you all have that experience. You all have a significance of how you interpret the world as having a particular large meaning that's part of your comprehensive viewpoint and how you put everything together when you look at it. So, what so let's, let's move on then to about we've said something about the experiential basis of religion and how it connects to our other experiences. What about making religious sense? So c can we conclude from this idea that somehow that our experiences generate meaning to move to something whereby religions actually say something factual? Are religions fact-asserting or are they just, you know, poetic truth or useful so society or are they psychologically beneficial? Because John, John, John Hick didn't have much time, actually, for people who would say, oh, it doesn't matter if religion's true or not, as long as it's just helpful, or it makes society work better, or it's encouraging. John Hick was, in a way, committed to what he might call what religions want to say about religion. Because we can have lots of sociologists and psychologists and theologians who reduce religion down to other explanations. But John Hick was committed to what he calls a religious interpretation of religion. And what religions do, of course, is they claim certain things about the world. They say the world is like this. There is a God. Or the world is like this. There isn't a God. <laughs> There's more to do with meditation. But this is the point, you see. So what difference, then, does statements of religion make? Are they fact-asserting or are they just poetical? Are they realist, as we might say, 
or are they non-realist, are they just poetical things? And John Hick was committed to saying that religious claims are realist. They actually do claim to say things about the real independent world, independent of us being around. Now, this is the question. So say, take a statement like, God is love. How do, you, how, do you, how do you show that to be a fact assertion? What would you go out and find to either prove or disprove the claim that God is love? And what people sometimes say is, well, actually, if you talk to religious believers and try to talk them out of the idea that God is love, they'll always widen the golden pearls. They'll always say, oh, hang on, God works in mysterious ways. So if you think of really strong reasons why God is not a God of love, or you, see, you show the evidence of all the suffering in the world, for example, does that count against the existence of God? And, and what John Hick would say is that often, or some critics of religion, sorry, would say, is that often that kind of statement doesn't have any criteria to show why it would be true or false. A famous uh, thinker called Anthony Flew gave an example of, of, say, somebody who says there must be a gardener who gardens this garden. So there's a wonderful jungle clearing, say, you come across. And somebody says, oh, there must be a gardener. This is so beautiful. It can't have been just by chance. And so they hang around and they wait for the gardener to turn up. And of course, the gardener doesn't turn up. But the believer in the gardener says, well, maybe the gardener is invisible. Well, so we'll, we'll put a fence around it so that they'll twing the fence if they come in and we'll, we'll know that they're real. Of course, nothing happens. But the believer in the gardener is still not, t t can't be talked out of it. So they say, well, maybe the gardener is immaterial as well as invisible. But the point that uh, Anthony Flew makes is, well, what remains of your original assertion? What's the difference between an invisible, immaterial gardener and one that doesn't exist at all? So when people say God is love, and you say, well, what about um, the Holocaust? Or what about Ukraine? What about all those other situations? Should these count against the loving God? Well, maybe there are reasons which people think of to say, well, God works in mysterious ways. We don't, we don't understand what's happening. And so when people say that, people say, well, religious claims can't be fact-asserting because there's nothing that would make them verifiable or falsifiable. They remain just poetry, therefore. Now, Hick wants to deal with this because he still wants to say... A glass of water, you mean. Hick wants to deal with this by saying, what would be the thing that would count for religious claims being factual, that you could verify them and show that they mean, they, they mean something? And he comes up with this idea, which I can put on the, part of the slide here, of eschatological verification. Does anyone know what eschatology is? Anyone know what eschatology is? Ah, so hand at the back there, yes. Life after death. That, that, that Oh, right. You, oh, uh, well, I'll give you the mic there. Uh, yes, uh, <laughs> sounds like you already know. <laughs> yes, uh, that's an excellent. Well done. Yes, eschatology is the doctrine of the last things, or it's about what happens after death at the end times. And you rightly point out that in this particular case, what John Hick is saying is that there is a, there is a test for religious claims to be fact asserting, and that's what happens after you die. Now, that, that, now, you might think, well, that's an odd thing to say, but the point is, is, is that the structure has to be such that you have a fact-asserting statement that can be verified or falsified. So if you say the, the answer will come in the afterlife, you've made a statement that will make an empirical difference to our lives, and you can show, therefore, that it's not just the realm of poetry. There'll be a definite event that shows that religious claims are fact-asserting and not just poetry for today. Now, you can see already, therefore, if that's the case, then John Hick is committed to the idea of life after death. Life after death is actually then very important to the whole structure of his thinking. And you find that comes out in a lot of other areas of his thinking. So uh, I know this is going to be a discussion you're going to have with some of your other tutors uh, later on this week for those of you who are doing these classes. But there's a, a basic forward look in John Hick's thinking. There's a cosmic optimism in the way that he looks at the world. And some of you might have, you who've done the philosophy of religion might have come across then the Irenaean soul-making theodicy. This is the idea that we justify the existence of evil and suffering by saying, well, somehow it's making our souls into better people. That we can justify evil, not by saying we've gone wrong, but by saying that what evil and, soul and, and suffering will produce in the long run will be something that far outweighs the evil and suffering that we've, that we've experienced. 
So John Hick's particular approach to evil and suffering is to say that there's a slow, long process that's going to take place of, of us being transformed from one kind of state of being to another kind of state of being, and that evil is somehow a, a function of all that too. So we justify evil not by saying we've gone wrong and we're to blame, but rather by saying that God will bring a great good future out of all the evil and suffering that's taken place. Again, that kind of viewpoint requires life after death. And what uh, John Hick does is he borrows the idea of a second century theologian called Irenaeus. And Irenaeus drew a distinction between what he called the Amargo Dei and the Similitudo Dei. And these are statements to say that, well, the image of God and the likeness of God so we're made in a way basic, we're made almost like bare life, bare human beings, the image alone. But where the process is to transform us into something to do with the likeness of God. Now, that's, he doesn't take that as uh, just face value. He, t- he does a kind of a modern reinterpretation of that. And he says it's rather like being transformed from self-centeredness to reality-centeredness. And that's the process that he sees taking place when you draw all religions together and don't just talk about one in particular. But also, it also means that if you're going to say, well, evil has to be justified by the great good outcome in the future, and it's not to do with us, to, we're not to blame for the sins of we've, we've committed, that's not the result of evil necessarily, but they, they'll be wor- worked out at the very end. Well, you have to be committed to universalism. So another kind of pillar, as it were, of John Hicks' thinking is, is what's called universal salvation. So there's no heaven or hell or final dualism necessarily. If you're going to argue that evil is justified by the great future ahead, you can't have hell there because hell is a perpetuation of of an evil. If if, if the forward look is your solution, you have to absolutely wrap it up. That's something to discuss, isn't it? So the question is, how does that go together with freedom, for example, could be a part of criticism of that point of view. But John Hicks' perspective, and he defends this very powerfully in his books, is universalism. The great hope is for everybody, and no one's going to miss out. There's a cosmic, a cosmic optimism, not just an individual optimism. Now, people have often tried to draw a distinction between uh, uh, the early Hick and the later Hick. And this is a big dispute that goes on among some of people who have studied John Hick. Is, that, is there a transformation that takes place in his thinking? So if you read the books like The Faith and Knowledge and Evil and the God of Love, Faith and Knowledge was written in 1957. Evil and the God of Love, the first edition, came out in 1966. And then you get a kind of a, trans, a, a change that takes place in John Hick's thinking around about the early 1970s. He wrote a book in 1973 called God and the Universe of Faith. And then there's this really fantastic book called Death and Eternal Life that came out in 1976. And if you compare the book in 1976, Death and Eternal Life, with the early book on evil and the God of love in 1966, John Hick has moved in his thinking. He's moved from being effectively a Christian apologist, which is what you find in evil and the God of love, to being a pluralist. Or rather by then, I think he was an inclusivist probably, around about the early 1970s. That is to say, he saw Christianity as being true, but he thought other religions were part of that truth. But eventually, he evolved his thinking to a full-blown pluralism. Now, some people say this, and we'll come to this a bit later on, is that does this mean you have to uh, kind of abandon the early works? Does it mean you can't read the early John Hick without a kind of a pinch of salt because he's changed his ideas? Well, that's something for you to think about. Let me give you an example of that. So you'll see it in a second, but one of the things he thinks about the divine is he thinks the divine is so far infinite and so ineffable, so far beyond, because it has to take into account all the religions, not just one. That in a way he says, well, this infinite is so, so far away or so far above us or so transcategorial that it's neither good or evil, purposive or not purposive. Because those things only apply to our own categories. They can't apply to the numinous in itself. So if you say, well, the God of love has to save everybody because how could the God of love leave people out of salvation? Well, if your ultimate is neither good or evil anymore, how do you justify that earlier thought, that early Christian idea, which was, which was very specific to Christianity about the love of God? Now, some people say, well, no, it's just a helpful myth that you find in in Hick's thinking and the later thing, he would determine it that particular way. 
That's something to discuss a bit about whether you, when you move away from particular traditional accounts of religion, do you have to abandon your original defenses for earlier problems, like the problem of evil and suffering? Am I okay for time, Dan? Yes. So another two hours then. No, I'm joking. Um, <laughs> So, uh, where are we? Sorry, I keep on looking. But my head. So, at this point, then, th there should be a Copernican revolution in theology, 1973. John Hick calls for a, Cop he writes an article called A Copernican Revolution in Theology. Who is Copernicus? Where is that? A scientist. What we do, do you know what he did was, which was different from what other people did? What he, what he said? That's right, the earth is not the center after all, and the earth revolves around the sun, well done, the earth revolves around the sun like the other planets. And so rather, so what, what does it mean for theology? Well, for John Hickey says, well, rather than all the other religions revolving around Christianity, in the way that some theologians work, Christianity should be seen like one of the other religions, like the other planets, revolving around the sun. I, there's a, another kind of center, a different kind of center for religion. So he says there should be a Copernican revolution in theology. We should start doing theology as, as comparative theologians or as universal thinkers or pluralist thinkers rather than just being Christian theologians thinking that everything revolves around that particular religion. So Christians must shift from the dogma that Christianity is at the center to the realization that it is God who is at the center and that all religions serve and revolve around him. And he also thinks if you read uh, the book Death and Eternal Life, uh, that different religions point towards a common conception of human destiny. So one of the things he does in 1976 is he takes all the religions' views about life after death and he does, does this fantastic eclectic job of bringing the, the different ideas together. Now some people have said, is that a legitimate thing to do, just to compare like with like in different religions? But it's a, a tour de force regarding how do you see a common destiny for all religions and it's an early attempt to bring together all the religious testimonies about life after death and you can read about that in Death and Eternal Life. Now I put here pluralism defending religions in their diversity and this is moving towards some of the final themes then that you find in John Hick's work. Please go forward. Actually I won't do that, that's a provocative statement. I'll, I'll leave the provocation to later. Um, now this, is, now, this is it. See, so if you say that all religions are equally valid, does that undermine religion or does it support it? Does it m make you think that it's watering things down or is it making things better? And people are divided, I suppose, regarding how they look at that particular question. Now what John Hick thinks he's doing when he's writing about, when he eventually says that all religions are equally valid, which is what he does say in the end, at the end toward his later writings, He's doing it because he wants to defend religion. Now, let me explain. There was this, uh, a great philosopher, a uh, Scottish philosopher called David Hume. And one of the main challenges he said is that the problem with religions is that they might all cite different kinds of experiences, but if they have different kinds of beliefs, they cancel each other out. So if you believe in miracles in Christianity and say, well, this miracle proves that Christianity is right, what about the miracles that might happen in, say, Hinduism? or say a miracle, the miracle of the Quran in, say, in Islam. Now, David Hume would say you can't have miracles confirming religions that, 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 that conflict with each other. They would just cancel each other out. They would be one proof would cancel the other proof, if you can see it that way. And this is one of the reasons why David Hume argues against religion, why he's a skeptic. He says that, unfortunately, different religions make it more likely that God doesn't exist. It makes it more likely that religion is, in fact, an invention of human beings. So how do you get round the idea that, human, that religions can be fact-asserting, they, they point to something real, but they contradict each other in what they say? How do you square that circle, so to speak? And what is pluralism is tr actually trying to do is to defend all religious experience, so to speak, despite its variety and its difference, and say that all these religious experiences aren't just fake inventions, they actually point to something real. But how do you bring them all together? So, his pluralism is a defense of religion as opposed to being something which is meant to undermine it, even though some people feel that he's trying to water down different beliefs. But again, that's the point of discussion too. 
Now, if you were to say, and if, you, if, 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 I, um, if, if I was Karl Barth, and thankfully I'm not, uh, but he was a great German theologian of the 20th century, he would say truth just comes out of the blue. And you find yourself in the light by accident almost, or you find yourself in the darkness by accident. But Hick, John Hick says, well, if you say, well, so-and-so, is, this person is in the light because they've got the right religion, but this person's in the wrong because, well, they've got the wrong religion, John Hick would say, can you tell the difference between these people? Is one obviously in the wrong and one obviously in the right? So when you look at, say, Christians and Muslims and Hindus and Buddhists, can you tell which one is right by looking at their experience and their behavior? So John Hicks says, when you look at people like the great saints in different religions, he says, can you tell the difference in their ethical lives? And that's one of the most powerful observations that he actually makes as a phenomenology of religions. He says, remember, he's an, an empiricist thinker. He thinks by what he can see. It's not about rationality or dogma or dogmatism. It's about experience. And he challenges them to say, he says this, people of other faiths are not on average noticeably better human beings than Christians but nor, on the other hand, are they, on average, noticeably worse human beings. That's the challenge. So if that's the empirical reality in all the difference of religions, surely an in one rational interpretation is to say that, well, maybe religions are referring to the same thing. Maybe it's having the same effects. By their fruits, you will know them. It made sense to have a bottle, I suppose. Anyway. <laughs> um, so we get, we're getting towards the final few slides now. Some of you are flagging a bit here. Um, so there's an important distinction to be made. Um, and this is the point where John Hick is inspired by Immanuel Kant. And one of the most famous things that Immanuel Kant said, and you might think it's obvious now because it's become so ingrained maybe in our thinking, is there's a difference between the thing in itself and the thing as it's perceived. So there is, there, is, there is one lectern here, you might say, in itself, but there are 200 interpretations of that lectern. There are 200 ways of looking at this particular lectern. There is the lectern in itself, and there, is, there are 200 interpretations of the lectern. And Kant really says that there's no way of breaking through the boundary to the thing in itself. We can only see things through our own interpretative lenses. We can only read things as we see them through those particular filters. And you might say, well, that's what John Hick was saying right earlier on, remember, between the difference between physical, moral, and religious experience. There's always a filter there. But here he formalizes it in a particular way using Kant, saying that there's a distinction between the thing in itself and the thing as it's experienced. Now, what John Hick then does is he extends this to religion itself. He's saying, well, how do, you, how do you square the circle of having all these different kinds of religions looking at th with all their different interpretations? And he says, well, look, there are the religions as they interpret things, but the behind all that, there is the thing in itself, the real or the God or whatever you might say, behind the scenes. And so all the differences that you find in religions take place at the kind of phenomenological level, our level of experience, the way we look at things. But the thing in itself, the God, the divine, whatever it might be, is, is forever beyond our reach. It remains in the noumenal world. And so Hick uses this basic Kantian criterion to, make, to, to come up with this interpretation of religion, that there is the real in itself, either God or whatever you want to call it. And all the different religions are kind of manifestations of that reality that lies behind them. And he's inspired, as I say, by this inspiration from Kant. So he writes, the noumenal world exists independently of our perception of it, and the phenomenal world is that same world as it appears to our human consciousness. Now this is it. He's moved from talking about God, and now he talks about the real. And the real is this category of choice about what that numinous is. And the real is that thing that lies behind all religions. And so he writes, the great world faith Christianity, Islam, Judaism, Buddhism, Hinduism, etc. embody different perceptions and conceptions of and correspondingly different responses to the real. So, so you can see that, can you see the epistemological structure? 
You can have as many differences as you want at the phenomenal level, and many different kinds of in, kind of seeings, as it were, of this lectern. But none of them have to get to the lectern in itself. None of them get to the God in itself behind all the different religions. That's the basic proposal on the table to be, uh, to be analyzed in terms of the religious landscape. Now, I, I, I'm sorry, I'm putting, I, I just, this is the point, <laughs> just, when you're, just when you're getting tired of putting longer quotes up. Um, but this is, the, so let me just read this to you. This is, this, this is one of the most important statements that John Hick makes about religious pluralism. And it should hopefully be, I hope, it's self-explanatory. But I, I'll, So it follows from this distinction between the real as it is in itself and it is his thought and experience through our religious concepts that we cannot apply to the real on siege, I in itself, the characteristics encountered in its personae and impersonae. Thus, it cannot to be said to be one or many, personal thing, substance or process, good or evil, purposive or non-purposive, for whereas the phenomenal world is structured by our own conceptual frameworks, its noumenal ground is not. So the thing that lies behind all religions is something is far beyond our comprehension. But look how far beyond our comprehension it actually is. This is part of the controversy, I suppose, that lots of thinkers have niggled over what John Hick has had to say. And look, he's saying, well, the thing behind it all can't be said to be good or evil, purpose of a non-purpose, personal thing. Because those things only apply at the kind of phenomenal level of the different religions. They don't apply to the thing in itself, says John Hick. But then, you know, what is it then, is some people's question. Has John gone so far in trying to include so much that it's difficult to define what it means. That's one of the challenges of this hypothesis. So I just, I couldn't, I thought I'd give you a picture. Um, so there you have this idea that above everything there is the real, the numinal real, the real in itself. And underneath that there are all the different sort of ultimates that you find in different religions. So you've got the Trinity in Christianity, Yahweh in Judaism, Allah in Islam, Ik Onkar in Sikhism, Brahman maybe in Hinduism, Shunyata in, in, in Buddhism. And I've kind of put them on that scale from kind of personal to impersonal in a kind of a s fake scale, so to speak. But these are all the differences you find in a, at the levels of the different religions. But beyond that, there is the real in itself. But it has to encompass, of course, all those differences. So just a couple more slides. Okay. So what do religions share? What, what, what is, what are, what's the basis of, of John Hicks saying that religions share similar kinds of traits? Well, he's saying that, that religions share, a are fundamentally alike in exhibiting a soteriological structure. That is to say, they're all concerned with salvation, liberation, enlightenment, and fulfillment. Put it this way, John Hicks' proposal is that religions share one thing in common. They are trying to transform you from some place to another place, from what he calls self-centeredness towards reality-centeredness. So all religions, he claims, are doing a kind of a, a transformation job, as it were, on human beings. So if you're going to say, well, what is it that religion's there for? What brings religions together? What is the commonality for John Hick? It's the ethical part of things. It's the transformation that religions have. So we c Now, let's notice, therefore, that dialogue between religions, then, this would, be, this would be my point, I suppose, tends to focus on what does it do for us. It's not about what is, it, what is the actual ultimate about. That's a conversation you can't have almost because the real is neither is far beyond all those conversations. It's far above all the action. What we can, though, is what John Hicks says, is you can see the effects that these different religions have on people. So the conversation almost between religions, the dialogue, is focused on the ethical level of conversation on, on what do the fruits show that a religion shows. Now some critics of John Hicks say, well how does he know that the good, surely that's part of the divine, surely that's a particular characteristic of God. I mean, I thought God was meant to be beyond good and evil. That is a question mark that people actually ask. But this is partly what the discussion is, that the center discussion of therefore between religions is what does the religion do to you? How does it transform you? And maybe that's the, that's the structure that religions seem to share. 
So religion's truth or untruth, this is something to discuss later on, consists of the appropriateness or the inappropriateness of the practical dispositions which they tend to evoke. So do you know if a religion, now this is, how, how, how would you say that, how put, this, put it that this way, like, is a religion true or false? The answer is, is it doing the right thing to you, says John Hick? Is it transforming you in the right way? That's the main criterion for judging the truth or falsity of religion. Not belief, notice. And what's so fascinating is that John thinks that if you're a humanist, i.e. you don't believe in God at all, but you feel you're being transformed by your humanism into being a less selfish person, then you're showing an adequate, appropriate response to the real. So you can see that even atheism almost, or humanism, is included in the vast spread of how John Hick looks at the landscape. Uh, and much discussion has, has been focused upon that particular thing. So this is interesting. Reli uh, so could you say uh, Christianity is true, or Hinduism is true, or Buddhism is true, or uh, Islam is true? Well, they are true, says John Hick, but they're mythologically true, but not literally true of the real in itself. They're mythologically true of our experience, and they definitely refer to the divine, but the right divine is far beyond all that. The real stands beyond all that. So when I say God is love, that's mythologically true of the real in itself, says John Hick. So just finally then, and a few things to say, there's, there's lots of questions uh, you can ask, I suppose, in the class, and maybe me later on, if you, I suppose I've gone over time. Um, but you know, what is the status of John Hick's, uh, this is a few questions, what's the status of Hick's hypothesis, the pluralistic hypothesis? Um, what does he want us to do with the pluralistic hypothesis? Does he want us to convert to pluralism? I was once at a meeting where John was giving this fantastic talk about pluralism, this was many years ago, and I was this young, uh, I was doing my PhD at the time, and I threw this question at him, I said, you, are, am I at a, a pluralist outreach meeting? Are you trying to convert us all to pluralism? So I, was try I thought, oh, I'll, I'll try and catch him out, uh, because, but he was far ahead of me, and he said, oh, no, no, you're not at not that, he, because his position was this, is that pluralism, in a way, leaves things as they are. It doesn't encourage you to transform yourself into a pluralist but to stay in each religion is equally valid remember so there is a question mark about what do you do with the pluralism that john hick is, is proposing to you um, well he would say stay put in your religion so so to speak but see that see that there is a bigger picture there are other things going on in other religions but there's been a question about the status of the hypothesis itself i'm not john hick would not be here to convert you to pluralism he would be here to as a philosopher to help you to philosophize in a particular way that you would see that there's a bigger picture. But he wouldn't say, oh, you need to convert away from your religion. That's an interesting tension, maybe, in his thinking. And so, how you, so that's the question, how does pluralism affect religious people? And then there's some people who say, well, does he do justice to religions themselves? Each religion will want to say, ours is the right one. Each religion will want to say, we have the truth. Is pluralism undermining that? Well, Hick thinks not. He thinks he's defending all religion in some way. But maybe there are some criticisms of pluralism to say that, well, maybe one religion is right and the others are wrong. And some people will definitely have those kinds of preferences. How much is included in the pluralistic hypothesis? Uh, what about uh, Satanism? What about that kind of religion? Is that in or out of the pluralistic hypothesis? Well, John Hick says no, because he says, well, the real indicator is, are, uh, is the effect of the religion having beneficial effects. But again, there's a question mark about how do we include and what do we leave out? And then this is a really cheeky question. Is it really pluralist? Because think about it, some, some critics have said, there's a, a famous critic called Mark Heim, for example, who says that Hick isn't pluralist enough. Because what he's trying to do is saying that all religions have a a kind of a reel behind them. And that's interesting. So why would you put that reel behind them if there are genuine differences between religions? Just say there's lots of difference. Why treat to, try to find a, a commonality at all? Maybe religions do different things to you. Buddhism does very different things to you than, say, Christianity does to you. Why try to make them? Is that a, a potential uh, discussion? And so finally, I regard John Hick to be one of the greatest philosophers of the 20th century, um, certainly in terms of his influence. 
the fact that we're having this meeting today, the fact that all of you have read probably some books and you found John Hick in those particular books, the fact that many years after his writing, you can still use things like the real eschatological verification, the RNA and theodicy are part of the common currency. But I suppose it's about zeitgeist. You often find that thinkers come in and out of fashion sometimes. And right now, I, I don't know what you think, but what the kind of fashions of intellectual thought are look like. There are some who are postmodernists, And postmodernism is very much into saying that everything's very, very different. And you can't find an overall narrative, so to speak. And there are others who disagree with that and say, well, no, the liberal tradition of finding universal commonality, that's the real course of action for our future. So there are people, there's a bigger kind of question about the spirit of the age, I suppose, about where does Hick's big grand vision fit into the world and philosophy itself? Is that still part of common currency? Is it now fashionable? Is it unfashionable? Those, these are question marks to be asked. And I suppose that his, you've already got the impression of what I, in my talk today is that his, his, his thinking appeals to those who want to continue traveling. So if you see your thinking is evolving, changing to empirical evidence or experience, then Hicks, your philosopher, if you know what I mean, he's the guy who will, in a way, walk you through that particular kind of journey. So for those who, in, in theology in particular, in philosophy and religion, want to continue traveling, Hick is a good travel companion. And, you know, what I would say also is that when you read John Hick's writings, you find that he's connected to what the religious questions are. You know what I mean? He's not asking a sociologist's question or a psychologist's question or a historian's question. He's asking questions like, is it true? Is there life after death? Uh, is my religion true? Where does it fit into the other religions? These are profoundly kinds of religions questions. And so he's right at the heart, as it were, of where the religious questions are being asked. Well, I probably tired you all out, but I hope you've enjoyed that whistle-stop tour of John Hick and some of his thinking. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Cheatham. If, I know we are already late, but if oh. there are some short questions, please ask them now. Otherwise, David will be here uh, uh, tomorrow as well, and you can just c catch him. And I will ask David to sort of repeat the question in the microphone so the live stream people can hear it as well. Okay, Pedro. Um, yes, so first of all, thank you very much for your lecture. It was very interesting. Um, so as a non-religious person myself, um, I was precisely wondering about what you were saying, uh, the thing you were saying about uh, humanistic approaches, non-religious approaches to the real. Um, so I wondered to what extent uh, non-religious people might be disconnected uh, or oblivious to the real, and if this connection could be like uh, manifested um, through other other parts of human passions, like art, like literature, like music. So. Very good, very good question. The question uh, from my humanist friend at the back is, uh, you know, can uh, uh, do, do, can one be? Tr I think you're saying, can you be transformed without reference to the the, the religion, but more like art and literature and culture. I suppose that that's, that's a really uh, good question because uh, is, um, the main, uh, uh, main indicator of John Hicks' uh, thinking is, is that it's, it's what, the, what your humanism does to you and what practices that you follow. To, and, and also, are you, being, are you, being, are you uh, applying yourself to, in your humanistic art, as it were, to some kind of salvific process for yourself or some kind of human development? I mean, there's lots of art we can, we can talk about that isn't like that at all. It's, it's actually deliberately uh, provocative. And that's a very good question, isn't it? About, well, you know, think of all the range of different kinds of art and what it can lead towards. But the answer, I suppose, from, from, this, th from, the, from the hypothesis point of view is to say that, well, to the extent that you apply yourself through your art to, to personal transformation, that in itself is a kind of a, an exhibition, as it were, of the real working. Now, it's interesting, there was, a, there was a humanist writer called Robert Meisel, and he once asked a question, precisely your kind of question, am I an anonymous realist, John? I, am I being forced into a kind of a religious rubric? Well, that's a very good question, isn't it? But remember, he's looking more at what are the effects of what you believe and what is that having on you, not what, what you actually believe about the divine. 
So yeah, your art and your humanism, if, you're, is, if it's applied to personal transformation, is a legitimate, appropriate response to the real. Thank you very much. Yes, Pablo. Well, that's, a, that's a, a very good question. I mean, there's a, a, a book, uh, oh, it, I think it's called The Rainbow of Faith, where, to, where he talks about cosmic optimism and, and asking himself, well, what do the major religions, or the, what's the majority report, you might say, of religions in question? So there's always going to be small ad hoc religions that do weird stuff, as it were. <laughs> um, and the question is, how much do you incorporate all that material in a total interpretation of religion? So the majority report is about transformation, that we look around uh, self-destruct. So we, we have a, a, a kind of a sense of what pessimism looks like or what destructive human activity looks like. And so he makes an overall judgment, I suppose. And that, that, I mean, there are, there, are, there are scholars in the literature who write, ex ask exactly that question. What right has John Hick got to eliminate certain or to uh, exclude certain religions or expressions from his overall pluralistic hypothesis. That could be a line of criticism, but I suppose the, the response might be something like, well, the majority report of the major religions is that a cosmic optimism and uh, wholesomeness for the human person is really what is, is the main indicator. Yes, Julia, last question. Yes. Uh, relating a little bit to what The question here is, is, is morality related to the real in itself, or is it something to do? Well, that, uh, well yes and no. A yes in the sense that, <laughs> yes in the sense that all the phenomenological eye, the, relig the religion's expressions of the real are, are real expressions of the real. They're, they're, they're appropriate, legitimate. But they don't speak about the real in itself. The real remains beyond all those categories. So there is a kind of a philosophical question about what is the causal relationship between the real in itself and everything else that takes place. And John is a little bit evasive about that. He talks about the impingement. Uh, that's a term he actually uses. It's a, very, it's a very good question. I mean, I have my own critical thinking about that. But I suppose he was, he was saying, judge it by its cover. The, the, um, when you encounter people of different religions, what, what's, what's happening at our level? And there seems to be a general report about uh, well-being, uh, uh, self-improvement. And he says, he then takes that as, as a kind of a majority report and says, that's an appropriate expression of the real. But there's much literature and there's much debate on his, on his, on his uh, allowance to do that. Yeah. Good question. Yeah. So let's uh, thank Professor Cheatham once more for his lecture and his answer.